All right. I've been wanting to do this one. I'm excited. Jonathan Blow apparently figure out the problem long before. This whole thing with the way open source software is done right now, where like there's a package manager and everybody contributes and it's like code sourced from anywhere in the world and you just auto download it. That is not going to last that long. <laughs> and the reason it's not going to last that long is that I could almost guarantee you that there are at minimum thousands of people around the world whose job is to inject bugs into open source. He like literally called that XE stuff. This was years ago too. Like, like I know this was uploaded. This was uploaded three months ago, but this, this video is from years ago. L take, have you seen what's happened? Dude, Giant Tan literally slow rolled for years to put one of the biggest back doors. Oh my goodness. Oh, L take is still the best. I know it is. I swear people just use it to get me. Man, open source is auditable. Yeah. Okay, so he's actually serious. So your argument is that open source is auditable. Okay, Tristan, why didn't you catch XZ then? It's, it, was, it was auditable. Why, why did it take two years for someone to accidentally catch XZ, one of the greatest exploits that almost just like literally made a set of versions of Linux unusable? Like re real talk, Tristan, like do you realize how dangerous that is? We unknowingly just download shit tons of code and execute it assuming open source is altruistic. How do we ha how do we prevent this from happening in the future? You can't. You like genuinely you can't pre prevent this from happening in the future. And what I mean by that, another great example is remember during the beginning of the whole like uh, the, the the Ukraine Russia situation when one of the NPM owners uh, had it so that if you have any sort of IP that might be from Russia, it would try to delete your root directory and delete everything off of your um, system. And nobody it was in some popular uh, OS some popular uh, NPM package, like, how do you know that's not going to happen another time, right? Like, that's going to happen. It's not based, okay? That's not, you're not fighting anything. You're just, you're just making life way worse because now that's going to be used anytime. <laughs> like, that's just, it's just another awful thing. Exploits suck. And that's the worst part is that security is on you. You can literally never catch everything. And that's why it's so difficult. It's because, like, especially with the XE, if you haven't seen this video, um, if you go to the, the, the YouTubes, low-level learning and I break it down, I, I thought pretty dang good. Uh, we, we, we went through several articles, and there's this one that had a really great bash one. I, I have a link to it. Yeah, this one. There's a link in there that's fantastic that just breaks it down completely. We go over it. I explain some of the things. Low-level learning explains some of the things. And it's crazy, like, how cooked this, this backdoor was. Like, I mean, we're talking like the build pipeline had three different stages, piping input from one to the next, cutting out stuff and putting it into another one to actually like eventually package everything together. It is absolutely crazy how it created the exploit. And like no person, no single human or AI would have ever been able to spot it because it is just like entirely too, it's so novel. It's incredible. It's so clever. Was it made by Russians? We, you know, there's a general. I think there's a general consensus that it probably had some level of state state uh, actors, because these people had to be paid, right? Like, I mean, it was. A, I mean, years of effort went into this thing. Source software for espionage purposes. Like, look. <laughs> there are give or take two hundred countries in the world. Most of those countries have spy programs. You could type source code from anywhere. It's very cheap. You don't even need to fly a dude anywhere, right? How many people do you think it's their job to just check shit into GitHub and NPM and whatever that has bugs in it? How do you think that's not a thing? And how do you think how long do you think things are going to go once people figure out that's a thing? I think everybody is, is very aware of it now. I think the awareness level is, 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 very, is very high now. It wasn't a bug. Yeah, I mean, I think he's using the term bug 
meaning security, uh, security, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, some sort of back, some sort of backdoor. Yeah, Jai Tan isn't a, actually a legit Chinese name. I know they even went over that with Jai, uh, Jai uh, being like, well, no one, no Cantonese would be J uh, I and Tan, and it would be Ten, and uh, they went over it. But I don't think AI is going to help in in these vulnerabilities. Yeah, if anything, AI will give a very false sense of security. And any like obvious thing that could be wrong, like. I mean, you you saw the reports. We again j just went over. I just went over what happened to the curl library, where they were receiving report after report of AI generated security issues that were completely stupid, that were not security issues. It was literally one line above. Check the length of the string. Next line, stir copy, and then it reports this whole gener. It, it started reporting stuff, started making up code, all that kind of stuff. Crazy. It would be, it would be, the thing is, is having AI, at least this generation of AI, maybe this will change in the future. I always, you know, you always, you know, I never thought I would, I would see the days of LLM level power, like being able to see videos being generated on the fly, right? Like I never had that kind of, I never thought that I was going to see that stuff just because that set, that seems too futuristic, but here we are. And so is there a future point in time in which you can create a model so powerful that it could actually be extremely useful? Maybe um, copium, but with maybe. Uh, it's not uh, really that novel. This type of attacks uh, happen a fair amount of times and have been uh, happening in years. Business as usual. I mean, yes, no. The problem is, is each one of these attacks are very, they're, they're novel in their own in their own way. Like, sure, people are attempting to attack GitHub, but like the one that we just saw with XZ is extremely novel on its own. I mean, we have people that are masters at bash, masters at compression, masters at security, and we're still on like day six, hundreds of hours being put into it, and people still don't fully understand how this exploit happened. This is not some, oh yeah, it's just a thing. Like it is extremely, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's more likely that it's just robots from the future generated this than anything else. Okay, we're actually just seeing the, the tip of the iceberg for Terminator. Okay, that's all we're seeing right now. The long con. The long con is very, very amazing. It was very, very amazing. It's a data compression library. Yeah, who would have guessed? Who would have guessed a data compression library was that good? In before everyone uh, commits uh, to self-hosting Git T, yeah, it's coming. Maybe it was an AI. I uh, doubt that it was an AI. It's, it's honestly, it's too clever. AIs are just the like average. Remember that. So even their clever schemes are average. The reason why you think AI is so amazing is because you look at pictures. And pictures, if I say draw a picture of a crab, anything that looks like a crab is a picture of a crab. That's the problem with AI. But when I say draw a perfectly white picture and it struggles to do that, that's because I just I gave it an exact thing to do. And that's the big difference between the two. How didn't they hack into the Linux kernel yet? I guarantee you they have. I guarantee you there's like fucking at least 17 <laughs> serious exploits in Linux. Man's just pulling numbers clean out. Pulling some prime numbers clean out the buns right there. They're at least 17 minimum. Minimum 17. Minimum specifically 17 exploits. I don't know JB's take on this is met. Open source, uh, it, it can be hacked. All right, bro, how? I definitely think he's right that... Open source is as much of a blessing as it is a curse, 100%. And no matter what, I don't think there's a there's a simple I don't think there's a simple solution to this. XZ 17 in Roman numerals. <laughs> All right, we got to keep going. This is gonna be a long video. Like easy ones. I don't even mean like you know obscure things. Can I guarantee that it hasn't happened to the Windows kernel? Um, no, I would bet that it has happened to Windows as well. The difference is with something like Windows, it's more expensive. A, uh, because you have to fly someone there and they have to work at an, a Microsoft office, right? Yeah. And you can fire them and all these things, right? Um, B, because you would have to fit the bug into a feature set decided by whatever project manager, right? So there's a level of check. With open source software, all you have to do is add some major useful functionality to some program that makes a lot of changes, right? But like, look, you did something really useful that every it's adding value for the people, right? And then you just put your bugs in there. It's easy. Um, he does have a good point. 
he I mean in some sense he does have a good point, which is LG LGTM is a real thing. LGTM is a most certainly real thing on open source, right? Uh but having a closed source behind the garden thing is much more difficult. Right? It is much more difficult. L take malicious actors being injected into companies to work on closed source stuff all the time. I mean, it would be hard for me to say the word all the time. I'm sure it happens, but I'm sure it's pretty selective which ones they actually want to do. Uh, I actually think that TJ's is much more um, – I think TJ's is probably much more likely that the U.S. government is like, we don't want a back door. We want a front door. And this front door is either going to come with the FBI crashing through or with you giving us the keys. You make the choice. I think that that's much more likely than some backdoor – back door get hired slow play 10 year front door with the red carpet roll it out or here we go i think that that's probably more reasonable as far as this one goes i mean i i do agree i, I don't think it's reasonable for big companies to maintain all those libraries yeah I, I i'm on your team what's the alternative how do you build a secure thing is there is there a way that you can is, is security just not real uh, do what uh, squeal light did uh computers are made by humans security is impossible yeah Security comes in layers. Yeah, it sure does. But there's some things that need a lot more layers than others. You know what I mean? Like, here's the deal. ExpressJS, I would expect to have a higher security standard than is odd. Does that make sense? There's, there's kind of approaches that you take <laughs> that make uh, that, that some things are expected to be more like looked at than others. But I guarantee you, ExpressJS is just not... Dude, uh, first project ever hacked was ExpressJS. <laughs> <laughs> they've been lo they've been long playing that thing for so long at this point. You know, when somebody else is deciding the feature that's harder, it still can be done. Um, but C companies still have some degree of QA before they put things out the door. Unlike, oh, again, the difference between an actual company and like an open source project is in an actual company, somebody is responsible for the experience of the software, right? And that he means is right a lot that. in terms of quality. Um, it still doesn't mean uh, as much as it used to, right? Um, and it does. He is right. I, I, I can't imagine people would argue against that, that you would hope that a company has more motivation to make their software better and more res resources. Oh, no. See, see, again, you quit having stupid takes. This is a stupid take. This, uh, this is then uh, L take, uh, take starts. A lot of OS projects have quality control. He never said that. He just said at the end of the day, someone is paid by a company to try to do the same thing. Open source is goodwill, right? Security is an afterthought. Pri uh, yeah, yeah. At least somebody is paid to, to make sure something is going on. Security becomes less and less of an uh, afterthought as your company gets bigger, right? I think your very first ones, the company is really small. Uh, JS on the back end is a psyop by the Russians. <laughs> JS on the back end. Um, yeah, and quality control does not equal security audit. Absolutely. But as a company grows, the more and more security they have. Like, imagine the amount of security engineers at uh, Netflix right now. In incredible number. Okay, an entire department's literally 100 people. Teach derailing a two, prime brain, a malagable lull. Yep, that's, that's me. All right, let's keep on going. It doesn't mean Chat's that nobody ever does quality thing. stuff in open source, but, like, it does mean... Okay, that, that's a little intense. I would say that there's a lot of quality stuff in open source. I think Jonathan Blow generally has a very negative view of open source. I don't think he's wrong in all of his takes of open source. I think he's just a bit jaded. There's just that extra layer of vetting that doesn't exist otherwise. I also think a lot of the things he does, he comes from, he has a very positive view of companies comparatively to open source. And I've seen some open source projects ran much better than companies. But I think on average, it's it's safer to say that a larger company has more effort to put into security than a lot of open source. To put it in reverse, right? Something like a compression library, nobody, no nobody's really thinking about like larger companies. Do security engineers at Netflix even do anything? Yeah, of course. What what kind of like honestly, what kind of stupid question is that? Netflix is like what a Fortune 100 company. You think that they just do nothing? There's an incredible amount of effort put in to ensuring that things don't get hacked, right? Like, of course, it would be crazy. Chat, what are you doing? What are you doing? Their team uh, is security against password sharing. That's not even, that's, that's a product team, dummy. How would you even know what security engineers uh, at Netflix? Uh, I used to play Ultimate Frisbee with one of them. 
How would you even know what security engineers at Netflix do, by the way, Prime Gen? Yeah, maybe, maybe your boy Prime accidentally created one of the largest security bugs at Netflix ever to this date. Okay? Maybe on accident that happened. So guess what? I've been in a few meetings with security engineers. It's really simple. The, 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 the exploit was really, really simple. It was very, very simple. Okay, so imagine this. You're on Netflix, and the first thing is like a big image right here, and then there's these little footers right here, and they go like this, right? And how far do you think they go? Well, I don't know. Do they go 10 out? Do they go 20 out? Do they go 50 out? Well, we do a lot of client-side caching, right? And so what we do is we're going to request some larger amount of uh, – amount of data, right, that exceeds the bounds of what you can see. This makes sense, right? And then we're going to cache those results into some JavaScript. Well, what happened when I ask for the 10th item in this row, but the 10th item does not exist, or the 11th, or the 12th, or the 13th? Well, I need to send back something that says, you know what, at 10, there's nothing here, right? There's nothing here, so don't try to request more data. There's actually nothing at this point, okay? Uh, don't Because that way, if we send back nothing, and it tries to request again, well, what is it going to do? It's going to go and request again. Well, we don't want to just keep requesting empty data, right? So we send back a little little type a little type value, a little boxed value that says, hey, this is a, we exist, and we exist as nothing. Okay, that makes sense. Well, we created something on the server called materialize. Materialize. And materialize, what it did is that when you requested this, it produced this little type of value. Now, it, this wasn't my idea, and we had a version of this semi-implemented in some way, and when we did the big Falcor open source push, I created the next version of said thing and made it fully beautiful and all that great stuff, and what it did is it just ensured that all these pieces of data were. Well, one day I was sitting there, and I was programming Falcor, blah, 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 and then I realized, wait a second, it just kind of like dawned on me. It's kind of like shower thought style. If I can request 0 through 50, and it will give me back 40 empty items, and Falcor allows you to do something like this, 0 through 50, 0 through 50, well, then I would get back a lot more doesn't exist items. Well, what happened if I request 0 through 50, 0 through 50, 0 through 50? Well, I'm going to get back a lot more items that don't exist. Right? Right. Huh. What happened if I keep doing that? So I decided one day to send up a path to Falcor. I did a little thing. I went to Netflix.com, took a path evaluator request, copied and pasted it from curl, put it into a shell script, put a little while true on it, and said, instead of whatever path I requested, let's just request 0, uh, zero through 50, 0 through 50, 0 through 50, 0 through 50, 0 through 500, whatever it was, and did like a billion items, right? And just did a little small little wild true loop, you know? And that's it. And then I put a little ampersand on each, uh, on each one of the curl requests, so that way it would just go into the background, because it would just take forever per request, just to see what would happen. You know, so we have this place called staging. I did it against staging, not, not production, because staging... Well, if it went down, people would complain, but a bunch of engineers would complain. Not production. So what did we do? Well, I just tried it out. I was able to kill machine after machine after machine. A three-line bash script could hold down Netflix ad infinitum. And here's the best part. This change was like a year plus, plus, plus old, multiple years old. There was no rolling back. There was only push forward. You had to fix it. Dude, I literally helped long con Netflix hard. Good luck finding that thing. Yeah, it's just the thing you didn't realize that could exist, right? So anyways, I went out and I uh, wrote a little thing. And I said, hey, uh, by the way, I think it was Kim. I think my manager at that time was named Kim. And I was like, hey, Kim. Hey, Kim. Kimothy. I think I may have broken I think I I think we I think we've broken things. I think we as the team have broken things and we should definitely think about we doing the right thing here. So I created a little Jira ticket 
And people were like, bro, this is going to take forever to fix. And it took so long. It was a multi-year fix. It took, it was so hard to like get it all done. And at like some point you could still kind of like it for a while, it even could be like held down through like some CPU fixing. Are they still fixing it? No, 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 no. We did, we did, we did a conference talk on it. Someone, someone wrote up a whole report. It's called the repulsive grizzly attack. Um, It was awesome. But let's just say we didn't fix the issue, but man, did I, I made an incredible piece of software that could do it. And you know what the best part about the whole situation was? Is that the package name in Java, by the way, it was written in Java. For those that, for those that don't know anything about Java, I wrote it in Java. Um, it was called, uh, it, there was a package that was supposed to be called exceptions, but because I have such bad dyslexia, I called it expections and I did not see it at all. It was called expections. So there's literally like Falcor dot expections in there. I didn't even see it. That's the best part. That is literally the best part. I did not know that. I know that's a brand new piece of information. And when I when I told my boss that I also misnamed the package expections, you know what he's, uh, this is later on, Satyan, you know what he said? We're going to keep it there for posterity's sake. Because it's too funny to change it. My, and so for a long time, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of good one. Take pride when you can't read. I know. You got to take pride when you can't read. It's a good story. It's a good story. Anyways. The Linux kernel has police. But like, you, okay, you don't understand. If you say that, you do not understand the magnitude of the problem and how easy it is. All right? It's true. It is so easy. If you're smart, imagine there is a programmer of approximately the same skill level as one of the Linux kernel police. Those guys are busy. All you have to do is make something subtle. Like you don't see here. I'm not saying you add some lines of code that say switch to root and open a shell, right? Like that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about introduce very subtle situations where a variable can have the wrong value that normally that's fine. But when you combine it with thing B and thing C, it happens to produce an exploit, right? I'm talking about that. Things that you would not see by looking at the source code. I guarantee you there are people around the world where that's their job. Yep. That's where this differs from XZ. Really? Tell me more. Tell me how it differs from XZ. Jayatan, switch the A and the I, becomes Jai. Jai is the language he's producing. Jonathan Blow. <laughs> Also, Illuminati, isn't that exactly what happened? Tell me how that difference. Well, XZ was one binary. No, actually, it wasn't one binary. It was actually two binaries, and it was multiple stages of the build pipeline. The first binary was actually a bad, corrupted stream in which if you replaced specific characters, it would actually become a good corrupted – it'd become a non-corrupted stream. And then that was able to produce a bash program, which would then take the second binary blob and take that – Good big file, I believe it was named, literally good, good large uh, X, Z, uh, whatever, and actually take that second one and then slice it up, discarding one, uh, two to the 10 uh, bytes, accepting two to the 11 bytes, discarding two to the 10 bytes, accepting two to the 11 bytes, and doing that over and over and over again until it s sliced out its entire yucky program with a little bit of extras at the very very end and then put all those together and then had the run on top of it a some sort of crazy replacement cipher and then it could do the next level of ciphering after that some sort of rc something or another to cipher where it generates a key and it did that in awk and then finally at that point after all rc3 rc4 yeah rc4 yeah it was it, dude crazy right at that point then it would be a binary that you could execute. So, yeah, it wasn't just a binary that was exploitable. It was several, 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 several steps for someone to get there, and it was hidden in plain sight. How do you explain this in terms of basketball? Okay, actually, it's very, very simple to explain this in terms of basketball. Okay, so imagine this. Some dudes are playing basketball, and they're going, and they're shooting, and they're shooting. But when they're playing, there's a group of people that are betting on the outcome of the game. 
Now, the people that are betting on the outcome of the game, what they don't realize is that one person on one side knows one of the refs, but doesn't know them quite well, right? Just only kind of knows them. And by knowing that one ref, they're able to talk to him. Now, here's the deal. It's not the refs throwing the game. The refs is actually best friends with one of the players. Now, one of the players is going to intentionally sink the game with some bad passes and some not awesome and stellar offense along with three other of his buddies, so it looks like an off night, to be able to lose the game to thus make the basketball players more money, to thus make the ref more money, to thus, in the end, make that one team or the one gambler more money. So that's actually what happened. Okay, It's several layers. It's not bad calls. The refs all look like they did very good. It just looked like a slightly off night. Yeah. So you're describing the NBA? Yeah, I described the NBA, actually, just in perfect terms. Anyways, there you go. It's not even a foul ref. Like, that's the best part. It's not even a foul ref. It's, it's worse. We're going to stop here. I think this is a good video. I think we kind of get that. We, we effectively get the gist of it. Uh, a good video, though. Appreciated it. The name is the Primogen.